Just one day before the start of the so-called peace summit in Switzerland, Vladimir Putin gave a lengthy speech to all the senior staff in the foreign ministry. This event also served as an announcement about Russia's intentions toward the war with Ukraine. The whole speech was uploaded on the Kremlin's homepage and an English transcript was added as well, showing the Kremlin meant this to be addressed to the West, not just to the Russian population. Putin once again, and this time in very clear terms, lies out three things. Russia is willing to negotiate peace immediately if Ukraine is willing to do so too. He lays out the preconditions for a ceasefire and he explains Russia's objectives for a lasting peace that is not just a quick fix but ends the conflict once and for all. I believe this is a very important speech as it gives us the Russian position as clearly as it gets and I will therefore share it here with you in English as we have translated the video so you can hear the Russian position for yourself. My own comments will be at the end of the video and the full 80-minute speech will be uploaded on this channel shortly as well. But here is Vladimir Putin's position on peace in Ukraine as of June 14th, 2024. While the West ignores our interests and forbids Kyiv from negotiating, it hypocritically calls on us to engage in some kind of negotiations. This looks simply idiotic. On one hand, they are forbidden to negotiate with us, and on the other hand, we are called to negotiations or hinted that we are refusing them. This is some kind of nonsense. We live in a sort of wonderland. First of all, they should start by giving Kyiv the command to lift the ban on negotiations with Russia. Secondly, we are ready to sit at the negotiating table even tomorrow. We understand all the peculiarities of the legal situation. But there are legitimate authorities there, even according to the Constitution. There is someone to negotiate with. Please, we are ready. Our conditions for starting such a conversation are simple and boil down to the following. I would now spend some time to reproduce the entire chain of events once again, so it is clear that what I am about to say is not a matter of today's circumstances. We have always adhered to a certain position, we have always strived for peace. So these conditions are very simple. Ukrainian troops must be completely withdrawn from the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. Moreover, I draw attention to the fact that this means from the entire territory of these regions, within their administrative borders, that existed at the time of their incorporation into Ukraine. As soon as Kyiv announces its readiness for such a decision and begins the actual withdrawal of troops from these regions, as well as officially notifies of the renunciation of plans to join NATO, an order to cease fire and start negotiations will immediately follow from our side. I repeat, we will do this immediately. Naturally, we guarantee the unimpeded and safe withdrawal of Ukrainian units and formations. We would like to hope that such a decision on troop withdrawal, non-aligned status, and the start of dialogue with Russia, on which Ukraine's future depends, will be made independently in Kyiv, based on the prevailing realities and guided by the genuine national interests of the Ukrainian people, and not under Western directives. Although there are, of course, significant doubts about this, Nevertheless, I want to once again say and remind in this regard, I said that I would like to go over the chronology of events once more. Let's take the time to do this. So, during the events on Maidan in Kyiv in 2013-2014, Russia repeatedly offered its assistance in the constitutional resolution of the crisis, which was actually organized from outside. Let's return to the chronology of events at the end of February 2014. On February 18th, armed clashes began in Kyiv, provoked by the opposition. A number of buildings, including the City Hall and the House of Trade Unions, were set on fire. On February 20th, unknown snipers opened fire on protesters and law enforcement officers. Those who were preparing the armed coup did everything to push the situation further towards violence and radicalization. 
The people who were on the streets of Kyiv during those days, expressing dissatisfaction with the then government, were intentionally used for their selfish purposes, like cannon fodder. They are doing exactly the same thing today, conducting mobilization and sending people to slaughter. And yet, there was an opportunity for a civilized way out of the situation back then. It is known that on February 21st, an agreement was signed between the then acting president of Ukraine and the opposition. The official representatives of Germany, Poland and France acted as guarantors of the political crisis resolution. The agreement provided for a return to a parliamentary presidential form of government, the holding of early presidential elections, the formation of a government of national trust, as well as the withdrawal of law enforcement forces from the center of Kyiv and the opposition's surrender of weapons. The Vakovna Rada passed a law excluding criminal prosecution of protest participants. Such an agreement, which allowed for the cessation of violence and the return of the situation to the constitutional field, took place. This agreement was signed, although both in Kyiv and in the West they prefer not to remember it. Today I will say more about another important fact that was not previously voiced. Literally, in those same hours, on February 21st, a conversation took place with my American counterpart at the initiative of the American side. The essence was as follows. The American leader unequivocally supported the Kiev agreement between the authorities and the opposition. Moreover, he called it a real breakthrough, a chance for the Ukrainian people to prevent the violence from crossing all conceivable boundaries. Furthermore, during the discussions, we jointly developed the following formula. Russia would try to persuade the then acting president of Ukraine to behave as restrained as possible, not to use the army and law enforcement agencies against the protesters. Accordingly, the opposition would be called to order, to free administrative buildings so that the streets would calm down. All this was supposed to create conditions for life in the country to return to normal within the constitutional and legal framework. Overall, we agreed to work together for the sake of a stable, peaceful, normal and developing Ukraine. We fully kept our word. The then president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, who actually did not plan to use the army, nevertheless did not do so. Moreover, he even withdrew additional police units from Kyiv. And what about the Western colleagues? On the night of February 22nd and throughout the following day, when President Yanukovych went to Kharkiv, where a Congress of Deputies from the southeastern regions of Ukraine and Crimea was supposed to take place. Radicals, despite all the agreements and guarantees from the West, both Europe and the USA, forcibly took control of the Rada building, the presidential administration, and seized the government. And not a single guarantor of all these political settlement agreements Neither the United States nor the Europeans lifted a finger to fulfill their obligations, to urge the opposition to release the seized administrative buildings and renounce violence. It is evident that such a course of events not only suited them, it seems that they were the authors of the development of events in this very direction. Already, on February 22, 2014, the Vakovna Rada, in violation of the Constitution of Ukraine, adopted a resolution on the so-called self-removal of the acting President Yanukovych from the presidency and scheduled early elections for May 25. That is, an armed coup provoked from outside took place. Ukrainian radicals, with the silent consent and direct support of the West, thwarted all attempts to resolve the situation peacefully. Then we urged Kyiv and Western capitals to start a dialogue with the people in southeastern Ukraine to respect their interests, rights and freedoms. No, the regime that came to power as a result of a coup chose war. 
In the spring and summer of 2014, it launched punitive actions against Donbass. Russia once again called for peace. We did everything to resolve the acute problems within the framework of the Minsk agreements. But the West and the Kiev authorities, as I have already emphasized, did not intend to fulfill them. Although in words, Western colleagues, including the head of the White House, assured us that the Minsk agreements were important and that they were committed to the processes of their implementation. What, in their opinion, will allow us to get out of the situation in Ukraine, stabilize it, and take into account the interests of the residents of the East. Instead, they organized a blockade of Donbass. The armed forces of Ukraine consistently prepared a full-scale operation to destroy the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. The Minsk agreements were finally buried by the Kiev regime and the West. That is why, in 2022, Russia was forced to start a special military operation to stop the war in Donbass and protect peaceful residents from genocide. At the same time, from the very first days, we have been proposing options for a diplomatic resolution of the crisis. I have already mentioned this today. These are the negotiations in Belarus and Turkey, the withdrawal of troops from Kyiv to create conditions for signing the Istanbul agreements, which were in principle agreed upon by everyone. But even these attempts of ours were ultimately rejected. The West and Kyiv took a course to defeat us. But, as is known, all of this failed. Today we are making another concrete, real peace proposal. If Kyiv and the Western capitals reject it, as before, then ultimately it is their business, their political and moral responsibility for the continuation of the bloodshed. It is obvious that the realities on the ground, on the line of combat contact, will continue to change not in favor of the Kyiv regime, and the conditions for starting negotiations will be different. Let me emphasize the main point. The essence of our proposal is not about some temporary truce or ceasefire, as the West, for example, wants to restore losses, rearm the Kiev regime, and prepare it for a new offensive. I repeat, it is not about freezing the conflict, but about its final resolution. And I will say it again, as soon as Kiev agrees to the course of events proposed today, agrees to the complete withdrawal of its troops from the DPR and LPR, Zaporizhia and Kherson regions, and actually begins this process, we are ready to start negotiations without delay. I repeat, our principled position is, a neutral, non-aligned, non-nuclear status for Ukraine, its demilitarization and denazification. Moreover, everyone generally agreed on these parameters during the Istanbul negotiations in 2022. Everything was clear regarding demilitarization. Everything was outlined, the number of this and that, tanks. Everything was agreed upon. Undoubtedly, the rights, freedoms and interests of Russian-speaking citizens in Ukraine must be fully ensured. The new territorial realities, the status of Crimea, Sevastopol, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, and the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions, as subjects of the Russian Federation, must be recognized. In the future, all these fundamental principles should be formalized in the form of fundamental international agreements. Naturally, this also implies the lifting of all Western sanctions against Russia. I believe that Russia is offering an option that will realistically end the war in Ukraine. In other words, we call for turning a tragic page of history. Let it be difficult and gradual, step by step, but it is necessary to start restoring relations of trust and good neighborliness between Russia and Ukraine, as well as in Europe as a whole. By resolving the Ukrainian crisis, we together with our partners from the CSTO and SCO, who are already making a significant contribution to finding ways for peaceful resolution, as well as with Western, including European, states, are ready for dialogue. We could begin the fundamental task that I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, 
namely the creation of an indivisible system of Eurasian security that takes into account the interests of all states on the continent without exception. Of course, a literal return to the security proposals we put forward 25 to 15 years ago, or even two years ago, is impossible. Too much has happened. Circumstances have changed. However, the basic principles, and most importantly, the very subject of the dialogue, remain unchanged. Russia recognizes its responsibility for global stability, and once again confirms its readiness to engage in discussions with all countries. But this should not be a simulation of a peace process aimed at serving someone's selfish will, someone's selfish interests, but a serious, thorough conversation on the entire range of global security issues. Dear colleagues, I am confident that you all understand well the large-scale tasks facing Russia, how much we need to do, including in the field of foreign policy. I sincerely wish you success in this difficult work of ensuring Russia's security, our national interests, strengthening the country's positions in the world, promoting integration processes and bilateral relations with our partners. For its part, the state leadership will continue to provide the diplomatic service and all those involved in the implementation of Russia's foreign policy with the necessary support. Once again, thank you for your work, for your patience and attention to what has been said. I am confident that we will succeed together. Thank you very much. So I think a few points are important to note about Vladimir Putin's speech. Uh, first of all, that he differentiates between different stages of what he clearly sees as a process. He mentions it at the end, this is this will take time and uh, the, this cannot be, all of it cannot be achieved in one instance, but he clearly thinks of this as a process. And uh, he is willing to talk immediately as long as there's somebody to talk to on the Ukrainian side. So let's remember that there's still a decree from the uh, from Volodymyr Zelensky that forbids the president from negotiating with Ukraine. On the other hand, the interesting thing is that he also Vladimir Putin seems to allude to the competent authorities in Ukraine and that they are still competent authorities, constitutional. What he meant with this is, of course, that Volodymyr Zelensky's term as president has come to an end. I think this is quite clear in the Russian thinking that the Russians don't regard him anymore as the legitimate uh, constitutional president of Ukraine, but they are at the same time saying that there are others that we can negotiate with. I don't know who exactly he's thinking about, whether he's thinking about the, the, the foreign minister or if he's thinking about the uh, well, let's say the diplomats in the foreign ministry of Ukraine or the parliament. Um, that would be a natural a natural place to go, right? That the parliamentarian uh, delegation might be able uh, and parliament would be obviously the one who would ratify any kind of agreements and therefore negotiate directly with the legislative branch. I don't know exactly what's going through his mind, but um, he clearly thinks that the as soon as, the, uh, as there is a Ukrainian counterpart willing to discuss, uh, Russia will do so. And uh, secondly, though, that in order to get to a ceasefire, um, he would demand that there would be a retreat from these uh, four oblasts that the uh, Russians are that are still enga engaging in, um, in in warfare with, um, especially uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia, which are not under, under complete control of of Russia, I mean, also the other um, others, um, Donetsk and Lugansk, there's not complete um, Russian military control. He says, if they retreat, then we stop the we stop the fighting and we stop so immediately. And we will, um, if we have an agreement on this, we will also um, let the, the Ukrainian forces retreat without without firing at them, right? Um, this, though, is then only the a ceasefire that he envisions. The on the, th the third part then would be in a peace agreement. And this agreement to me is really the most important thing because it lays out um, the visions of the Russians for a uh, for a solution of the conflict. And we know that we now in Switzerland probably going to get something like a Western Western position or a Ukrainian position, what they want. And we know the peace this ukrainian peace formula which is basically a a capitulation 
from from the Russians, a retreat from all uh, territories, in, including from Crimea, and um, war a criminal tribunal against the Vladimir Putin and and the other uh, the others in Russia, who the people who are basically sitting in this room. Um, <laughs> so. I still have the hope that something more reasonable will come out of the of the Swiss peace summit that can actually uh, that can actually serve as some form of uh, actual negotiation uh, negotiating position but here what Vladimir Putin lays out is is Russia's negotiating position and it and what it wants this is to me not necessarily all of this will come will, will come through this uh, this is what what um, Vladimir Putin is willing to ne to to negotiate about so as soon as you as you indicate that there's something negotiable you know that there are there are somehow uh, moving lines but the the basic premise is very very clear and it's these uh it's really the the neutral and non-aligned and uh, non-nuclear status of ukraine so this that he that he combined these three terms together was was quite interesting to me um that he even he differentiates between neutrality and, and non-alignment non but he wants both of this it's just utterly clear no nato membership and no um no uh, military alliances with any uh, any outside force but that means also no military alliance with russia right so uh, ukraine you remain as a buffer the way that this was envisioned in, in in envisioned already two years ago in the istanbul agreement so um this one is is the is the core of everything the rest of where uh, what exactly then also happens with the regions? I have this strong feeling that there is uh, that there's negotiation room there because did you notice that Vladimir Putin actually referred to Donetsk and Lugansk as the People's Republics? He didn't refer to them as uh, Russia's region of regions of Donetsk and Lugansk, which under the uh, the Russian Constitution now they are considered. Um, he oh, he he says, of course, they are they are now part of the Russian uh, state territory. But the fact that he still refers to them as the People's Republics, which was the status. Um, before the incorporation into Russian state territory, that, that kind of seems to hint to me that there is some sort of negotiation room there now. Um, I want to say that I cannot look into Vladimir Putin's head, and I do not I do not exactly know what what the the, the Russians would be willing to uh, to do or not, especially um, now that they have the military upper hand. But it is pretty clear that in this speech, Vladimir Putin wishes for peace. Right? It is clear that the, the he that there is a Russian wish to end this bloodshed, but not at all in any costs. Right. So the, the the question is, can the process start that will first lead to the ceasefire and then secondly lead to serious negotiations um, that then will also be verifiable, very a verifiable end to this um, process. And but it would be a, a gradual process out of war. That's that's how he sees it um, unfolding. A literal return to these Istanbul agreements is not possible, he says, but it can serve as a basis of negotiation. And uh, this is interesting, uh, Lee, exactly the things that we have heard before. We've heard it in the Tucker Carlson interview. We have we've heard it um, since the Tucker Carlson interview several times that Istanbul is still something that can serve as a beginning, not as an end, but as a beginning uh, to to talk with to talk to each other. Um, and of course, the demilitarization and denazification, meaning getting rid of these Azov battalion people and and uh, getting back to a constitutional order uh, in in Ukraine. That is obviously also something that um, that is uh, that that Russia demands in order to make this also predictable. What's happening there? Uh, but here we've got it in 2024. We've got the we've got again an offer for actual negotiations from the Russians on the table. So the question is, uh, why can the collective West and Ukraine not take this and say, yes, OK, let's sit down. And uh, the only answer to that is that they're the ones who still think that there's more to win through war than through peace, because Vladimir Putin seems to think that through negotiations you can win more uh, or you can you can end this. Whereas the West seems to believe that only um, with uh, with military power you can end it. Uh, let's see uh, how this will play out also with what comes out of Switzerland in the next couple of days.